Hello and welcome to North Shore Fellowship's online service. We are truly glad that you are here. Please click the like button, the share button, or share the link directly if you're watching on YouTube. Ah, let's take a breath together. Let's ease into today's worship. Let's try and put aside the distractions of the day and focus on what God has for us. Let's pray together. Father, we ask your blessing upon this time. We ask that you let us have a feeling of community with each other, that we're able to hear from you through your word and in our worship. Father, help us to have pure hearts. Help us to have minds that are hungry for your truth and help our spirit connect with you. Help us to be better people. No matter our situation today, Help us to be better people because we're meeting with you now. We ask you, Lord, meet us in this time. Bless the worship, bless the teaching, bless the fellowship. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. we could ever bring worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you Jesus the name above every other name Jesus the only one who could ever say Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh
continuing our series being the church which is is a study of first corinthians and it's paul writing a letter to a church that he planted in corinth and he's addressing some specific problems in that church now he's already stated that the church is doing well in some areas moving in the gifts having knowledge and a few other things but there are some specific things that are holding them back and you could see paul's frustration as he has to identify things that really point to their immaturity when in some areas they're advanced and in other ways they're just acting very childish. And here's where he goes. Last week, actually, he was addressing some serious sin that they were tolerating in the church. And the message was that they need to repent of that and repent not with pride in their heart, but with contrition and humility. And this week he continues in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. So let's just read the first nine verses, and here we go. If any of you has a dispute with another, do you dare to take it before the ungodly or judgment instead of before the Lord's people? Or do you know that the Lord's people will judge the world? And if you are to judge the world and are not competent to judge trivial cases, do you know that we will judge angels? How much more the things of this life? Therefore, if you have disputes about such matters, do you ask for a ruling from those whose way of life is scorned by the church? I say this to shame you. Is it possible there is nobody among you wise enough to judge a dispute between believers, but instead one brother takes another to court, and this in front of unbelievers? The very fact that you have lawsuits among you means you have been completely defeated already. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? Instead, you yourselves cheat and do wrong, and you do this to your brothers and sisters. And once again, Paul is reminding them that they're not acting like who they are supposed to be in Christ. He wants to remind them that they are temples of the living God, temples of the Holy Spirit, as he stated. They're ambassadors of the kingdom of God here on earth. And then they're not acting that way. In fact, they're taking their internal disputes to the world to have the world judge them. For he, he, he talks about judging. And we as God's people understand what the will of, of, the, of God is so that we should be able to judge these matters, not ask the world who don't even know who God is to judge us. And he says it in verse 2. He says, do you not know that the Lord's people will judge the world? Basically, we who know God's will and understand the values of God and the kingdom of God have more of an ability to make wise judgments than those who don't. It should go without saying. Uh, you know, it's, it's apparent here that they're, they're seeking after worldly ideas and worldly values and bringing those into the church. They have disputes with one another, and instead of working it out, instead of seeking the, the wisdom of the kingdom of God through the spirit of God within them, they say, you know what, let's just go to people that don't even know God and see what they have to say about our dispute. Terrible. <laughs> and then he mentions something else. He says, uh, talks about judging angels. Well, verse 3 said, do you not know that we will judge angels? How about that? It's a pretty interesting verse, isn't it? Some kind of get confused and puzzled over this verse. Well, here's the key. The Greek word for judge, krino, also means to rule or to govern. Okay, so judge is in this context to rule and to govern. So the Bible talks about us ruling for sure and that God rules over the angels. In Psalm 103, 20, it says, Praise the Lord, you his angels, you mighty ones, do his bidding and obey his word. The Bible also says that we are seated with God, right, as in, in heavenly realms as co-heirs. Right? He, he allows us to be part of his kingdom seated with him. Uh, Ephesians 2.6 says, God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Romans 8.17. Now, if we are children, well, then we're also heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. And Revelation 5.10 says, and he's made us kings and priests to our God. We're reigning on earth. So regarding judging angels, particularly the fallen angels, a scripture does teach that they will be judged. In fact, in Isaiah 24, 21, it says, In that day the Lord will punish the powers in heavens above and the kings of earth below. All right, so, so we are joint heirs with Jesus. We inherit, we are seated in heavenly realms, in the heavenlies in eternity. And so, yeah, as God judges, so will we with him. 
And he says all this, he's talking about all this, to remind them of their elevated place in the hierarchy of the universe, in the hierarchy of the kingdom of God. And here they are, seated in heavenly realms, given the spirit of God, acting as ambassadors of the kingdom of God, yet they're just being mere humans. They're acting like mere humans and not those operating in the power, maturity, and authority of the kingdom of God. And so apparently in this, some of the believers in this church have gotten in disputes with one another. And Paul says, do you dare take it before the ungodly for judgment? Verse 5, I say this to shame you. Is it possible there's nobody among you that is able to judge? See, Paul's upset, first and foremost, that there's quarrels and disputes. And they've risen to a level in this church, where, again, they're supposed to be the example of the kingdom of God, those who will show the world what it is to love one another, show the world that they have the wisdom that is far superior. But these people are taking their dispute outside the church to worldly people, to ungodly people, like we pagans, and say, hey, we need your wisdom. We need you to weigh in and chime in on this. And these are people that don't even believe God. They don't believe the truth of God. And they have no basis for judgment. And, And this church is doing that. Okay, so Paul's frustrated about that. He actually says, if you've gotten to this point, you're defeated already. He uses that term. Why? because they're acting like typical men and women of the world, just mere humans, and not those who are living by the Spirit and the kingdom of God. And that's what his purpose is for this church. That's what his desire is for this church to mature into an expression of the kingdom of God here on earth. 1 Corinthians 3, we read this a few weeks ago. It says, you're still worldly. And for since there's jealousy and quarreling among you in verse 4, Are you not so worldly you're acting like mere humans? Remember what that meant when he wrote it. They were not living and walking in the spirit, but they were walking according to the flesh. They're more concerned with what their flesh craves than what the spirit desires. And they were more concerned about their own rights and their own self-interest and their own possessions than they were about advancing the kingdom of God. And they were even fighting each other over it fighting each other. Galatians 5, 15 and 17 says, if you bite and devour one another, watch out or you'll be destroyed by one another. So I say, walk in the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what's contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh and they are in conflict conflict with one another so that you are not to do whatever you want. In other words, don't just go doing what your flesh is leading you to do. You've got to walk in the Spirit. Remember, the Spirit and flesh are in conflict with each other. That goes for all of us. The flesh desires this. The Spirit desires this. It's like a tug of war. There's a a graphic with the Spirit versus the flesh and a tight tight tug of war rope being yanked one way or another. And we can determine where we set our affections and our mind. In fact, Romans 8, 5 says those who live according to their flesh have their minds set on what the Spirit desires, and those who live according to the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. And so the mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. Your mind is basically a a faction of your soul, right? Your soul is your mind and emotions. And what your soul is fixated on, if it's the desires of the flesh, well, guess where that tug of war is going to end up? If your soul, your mind and emotions, is fixed on pleasing God and what the Spirit desires, well, then the Spirit will have victory, and so will you. So in chapter 6, he goes on, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, he goes on to address those living in sexual immorality. But not just that, he also includes idolaters. It means people that idolize things and people. Thieves, obviously people that have a problem with larceny. Greedy, people that just want to acquire things, right? Uh, And at the expense of others. Drunkards, people that are inebriated. (laughs) Uh, Slanderers, people that can't control their tongue and use it to attack and disparage others. And then also swindlers, people that are not fair in their dealings with and go intentionally to try to cheat others. So all of those he addresses. And he tries to remind those he's writing to in the church that they too formerly wore all those titles, that they were just like all these before they were saved, before they were washed clean, before they began the sanctification process of becoming more and more like Jesus. And he explains that if they continue living in this way, They're allowing themselves to be governed by the flesh 
and they won't experience the good stuff of the kingdom of God. They won't. They won't experience the power. They won't experience the joy. They won't experience the peace of the kingdom of God. So let's read the next few verses. In verse 9 it says, and, Or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do you not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, or the greedy, or drunkards, or slanderers, or swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God? And that is what some of you were, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our Lord. I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but, you will n- but I will not be mastered by anything. You say food is for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy them both. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will also raise us as well. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do you know do not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her body? For it said, the two will become one flesh. But whoever is united with the Lord is united with him in spirit. And verse 18 just gives you this imperative. He says, flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price, and therefore God honor, honor God with your bodies. And that's, verse, that's chapter 6. So he mentions many types of sins. He does. He lists them. But he does focus on sexual sin. He makes a point of, of, of singling that out and telling you why it's a little more serious. And let me say this. Here's why. He says it. He says, our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And even though our bodies are not the same as our soul and the spirit. You know, we have body, soul, and spirit. They're, the soul and the spirit are contained in this vessel. The soul and the spirit are contained in these jars of clay. And 2 Corinthians 4 tells us that. It's important what we do and what we don't do with these bodies, with these vessels, with these jars of clay. And here's why it's important. You ready? Because of love. Yeah because of love. Let me explain. Here's my simple theology. There's only one purpose for the world, and there's only one problem in the world. The, only, the one purpose for the world is love. More specifically, loving and being loved by God. That's why all this was created. That's why he created everything. You and me, birds, trees, planets, the whole bit. And, and he also What's also important, because Jesus says this, yeah, loving God is very important. And the second most important thing is like it. And that's loving each other. In fact, when Jesus was asked, what's the most important thing in the world? In their terms, really, what's the greatest commandment? But they meant the most important thing because the commandments were the most important thing. Jesus replied, love. You know it, Matthew 22, 36 through 40. Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law, they asked. Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on those, these two things. All the law and the prophets, that meant any, everything that ever was, is, or ever will be important hangs on these two things. Love God, love others. So so love is the most important thing in the world. More specifically, a love relationship with God and a love relationship with others. Here's where we're going with this. Of all the love relationships with others that exist here on earth, there is one, one, that's considered holy matrimony. The relationship of a husband and wife. It is intended to be the quintessential relationship here on earth. It is intended to be the one that's the center of most families. It's intended to be the relationship that children come into the world through. Now we live in a fallen world. It's not always that perfect, but this is God's intention. And it's also the relationship that mankind, the human being's most intimate expression of affection is is reserved for. And what we're talking about is sexuality. You see, this is the most intimate expression of love between two human beings. 
And remember, love is the primary purpose for human beings to exist anyway, loving God, but also loving what? Loving each other. That's why God designed it, that out of that come children. This is the way God designed it. This is God's purpose for marriage and, and people, men and women, male and female. In fact, Jesus said this. This is Jesus' statement on gender and marriage. Have you ever heard Jesus' statement on gender and marriage? It's really simple. Matthew 19, 4. Haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning, the creator made them male and female. And he said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. The next chapter, 1 Corinthians 7, we'll talk more about marriage and see how Paul described it. And also that there's times where it's not best, not most important, not the best interest of the person to be married. Actually, Paul says uh, it's better to remain unmarried for some. So we'll look at that in chapter 7. But back to the simple theology. One purpose, one problem. So we know the purpose, love. Love God, love each other. But what is the one problem? What is the one problem of the world? You guessed it. The one problem of the world is sin. Sin. You see, the reason sin is the one problem of the world is it because it was designed by the evil one to be, have, to, to be a destructive force against the one purpose of the world. Love. Relationships with God. Sin always has a destructive effect on relationships, either with God or with each other. Sin is not ar arbitrary. It always affects our relationship with God or other people. In fact, if the greatest purpose is love, then sin is the opposite of love. Sin is the opposite of love. Love means I want the best for you. I want your life to be great. I want God's blessing upon you. Sin is the opposite. I want you to serve me. I want my life to be good, even at the expense of yours. So Paul mentions in this chapter a variety of sins. He doesn't just mention sexual sins. He mentions all kinds of greed and larceny and, and slandering and talk and all these other things. But according to 1 John, there are only three categories of sin. This is getting pretty simple, isn't it? One purpose of the world, love. One problem of the world, sin. And only three categories of, the sin, of sin, and I'll tell you what they are. 1 John 2.16, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Lust of the flesh, satisfying the senses in excess, disproportionately, inappropriately satisfying the senses of the body. Lust of the eyes, that's coveting, desiring that which does not belong to you. Lust of the eyes. And pride, maybe the most insidious. This was Lucifer's big one. Wanting to be considered better than the others, higher, more important, more successful, more attractive, more powerful, more talented, etc. Wanting others to look up to you, not down on you. It's pride. Now, all sin falls into at least one of these three areas. Sexual sin, however, may fall into one, two, or all three of these categories. It could be the lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and pride all at once. And it has a destructive effect on our ability to give and receive love. And that's important because remember, that's why we're created. But Jesus came to save us from sin, all sin. He came to forgive us of sin and cleanse us of our sin and our unrighteousness. Remember what we read in 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but all to come to repentance. Remember what we read in Romans 2, 4, that God's kindness leads us to repentance. And remember what repentance means, changing your mind. Metanoia, that brings about a change in your mind. And in this instance, in this context, changing your mind about all three areas, right? So if we change our mind about lust of the flesh, that means do not be fixated on seeking pleasure and comfort. Rather, seek to meet the needs of others. Change your mind about the lust of the eyes. Be grateful, not covetous, but grateful for what God has given you and willing to rejoice when God blesses other people with good things. That's a change of mind about the lust of the eyes. And pride, pride. Be willing to be a servant to others, preferring others even over yourself. 
Philippians 2, 3 says this, let nothing be done from selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. See, this is contrary to the dominance of sin. This is the law of love, which is the value system of the kingdom of God. All of us fall into th- all, any of these three areas at any given time. On a regular basis, you probably step into one of those three buckets. <laughs> all of us need mercy. All of us need forgiveness. All of us need, most of all, the grace of God, the grace of Jesus every day, because we're saved by grace through faith. And the good news is <laughs> that his mercies are new every morning. His love endures forever. And get this, Romans 5.20, where there's an abundance of sin, well, there's even more of an abundance of grace. Grace. And that's the good news. If there wasn't that good news, we'd all be lost. And this would all be a real depressing journey because we'd have no hope other than be overcome by sin. But even when we just read in Romans 5.20, if there's an abundance of sin... There's even more of an abundance of grace, God's unmerited favor towards us. So, we as a church, we do not take sin lightly. We don't take sin lightly. And it's not because it violates our rules. And it's not because it, you know, violates our legalistic policies. No, we don't take it lightly because it keeps us from experiencing the fullness of of a love relationship with God and others that is the very thing that we're created for. That's why, and that's serious. That's why we try to be a place. And believers, we need to be a community where we're more committed to loving and gently restoring people from the struggles of sin than we are to condemning them and and, uh, rejecting them because of their sin. We need to be a place where forgiveness is, is given gracefully and generously. You know, we're, if we're experts at if anything, if we, should, we should be experts at forgiving. <laughs> because that's really the one thing Jesus asks of us. Forgive us our sins as we forgive others. Galatians 6.1 says, If someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. You who live by the Spirit, if you consider yourself spiritual, if this church in Corinth was spiritual, this would abound. This restoration of gentleness would be prominent. But apparently it was not. But if I or you live by the Spirit, if we consider someone who lives by the Spirit, or we consider ourselves those who live by the Spirit, well, one thing will be evident. Many things will be evident. (laughs) but one in particular, the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit. And we would be able to use the fruit of the Spirit that comes from living in the Spirit, the the love, the patience, the kindness, the gentleness, the meekness, all those things and more to help restore a brother or a sister who's struggling with these or any other sins. This is what it means to love one another as I have loved you. Jesus told us that in John 13, 34. Love one another as I have loved you. So, unconditional love, forgiveness, mercy, and grace. This is how Jesus loved us. And all he asks is for us to do likewise. God bless you. Well, thank you, Pastor warmest greetings to you all great to be with you again well the weather outside is actually pretty good you'd almost think it was spring i'm afraid it's not it'll probably get cold again but let's enjoy the warmth while we can let's dig in and see the upcoming events that we have first up reminder gentlemen this coming monday is valentine's day be prepared uh 
pleasure to announce that we are hiring. Yes, we have a position to fill at North Shore Fellowship, and that's for a children's ministry assistant position. It's going to be uh, working with the TOTS and the pre-K. It'll be during our Sunday service at the Bell Works building, so it's four hours a week. We have a flyer with all the information on the job responsibilities and requirements. If you are at all interested, contact our church administrator, Melissa Balsamello, at her email address. I want to remind you that Experiencing God, our new Sunday morning small group, started last week. We are meeting again today. We didn't skip a week because we had missed because of the weather, and we will meet again next week. Still not too late to get in on it. That's 9 a.m. at the Bell Works building. If you have any questions or would like to get information, your contact for that is Sue Avery at her email address. For the gentlemen, this coming Saturday is the third Saturday of the month, so it's the Men's Monthly Fellowship. That's February the 19th at 8 a.m. Our guest speaker is going to be our own Dave DiPietro, yes, our worship leader. I've heard him speak before. You will be interested in what he has to say, guys, and you will be blessed. So that's at the Peninsula location at 8 a.m., uh, rain or shine, so come on out and enjoy. If you have any questions, we have a contact for you with Charlie Avery at his email address. For the ladies, on Mondays, they have their regular Monday Zoom call Bible study. We want to let you know that they're starting a new study, and that would be on February the 21st, and it is entitled, How to Read Your Bible, Understanding the Greatest Story Ever Told in 30 Days. Sounds like it is a terrific study. We have all the details on there. Again, it's a Zoom call, so you do it from the comfort of your own home. If you have any questions, we have Lisa Jeannie as the contact there with her email information. Hey, our midweek service, Worship in the Word, where we go live on Facebook and YouTube, starts at 7 p.m. I want to let you know the schedule. We will meet this coming Wednesday. That would be the 16th. We will then have two weeks off. That would be February the 23rd and March the 2nd. And then we will be back for March the 9th. So indeed, just note the schedule and note the changes. We do have plenty of other services recorded, so if you're would like it, you can go over to YouTube and find plenty of things that you can watch in the meantime. A lot of these things to remember, links that you wouldn't know, email addresses that you might not remember, you know how you get this easy, right? Get on our email list. Send your contact information to us at info at northshorenj.org. Comes to your inbox, you have it there, click on it, and you're ready to go. Reminder for our online friends, Sunday online services, 9 and 10.30 a.m. on Facebook and YouTube premiere. Our Sunday in-person services are, of course, the Peninsula Worship Service at 9 a.m. in Fairhaven and the West Worship Service at 11 a.m. at the Bell Works Building. Well, we do want to say thank you to all of you who have been so faithful in your support for all that goes on here at North Shore Fellowship. We would like to invite all of you to come and participate with us financially. You can do that through our website. We have a QR code. You can text it in. You can even mail a check if you like. But we do invite you to come and participate in the work and mission that we have going on here at North Shore Fellowship. Would you please join me in prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you and we are delighted and thankful for all that you give and the blessings that we have. Father, we take this time now and take a portion and give it back to you. We offer it to you and ask that you would use it, multiply it, and direct it as you see fit. Father, we'd like to see this go toward the work to build your kingdom here on this earth. Father, we thank you and praise you. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So look, check out the various services. We have meetings. We have in-person. If you're still concerned about COVID, we have Zoom calls. And there'll be even more things coming up as the weather starts to get better. So we have plenty of things to do. Please do take advantage of them. Come and join us in any way that you can. So hey, stay safe. Have a terrific week. And may the Lord pour out blessings upon you. Thank you so very much.
joining us at North Shore Fellowship Online. Yeah, we're glad that you can join this way. And do you know that you can watch the sermon again or even get the notes uh, by going to northshorenj.org and just clicking on sermons and finding this message. At any time, you can do that. So I encourage you, if something touched your heart or you want to share it, go ahead and do that. Hey, if you have never given your life to Jesus, if you've never committed, completely committed your life to Jesus, today is the day for that. Allow us to lead you in a prayer. All you need to do is reach out and tell us. I hope to see you again online. I hope to see you online on Wednesday night for our Worship in the Word. Or think about coming and visit us so we could see you face to face. God bless you and have a fantastic day.